today, Acts chapter 1. We started our study on the book of Acts last week, and uh, we kind of laid down a laid down an introduction and foundation, uh, you know, for getting into the study. And I think we technically got through the first two verses. And so let's uh, let's read through these first five verses, and then we'll just kind of go back into a little bit of review, and um, you know, just. As we start studies, you know, I always want to encourage you to take your notebook, write your notes, have your pens, uh, because, you know, I found as I was speaking through it and teaching through it, it's like, it's a lot of information, especially if, if you've never studied, um, you know, book of the Bible and, and had a foundation or, or introduction like that, or if you've never studied the, books of, the book of Acts, uh, you know, just laying dates and context and people and things like that, it can, it can be, uh, you know, kind of like uh, drinking from a fire hydrant, like I like to say. So uh, writing them down and, and going through them and studying them in your own time is definitely a good thing to do, too. Uh, so let's go ahead and, and uh, start here. If uh, someone might be able to pick up, uh, Greg, would you mind uh, reading for me? Of uh, first five verses, please. Got Appreciate it. that. The first account I composed, the- Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. To these he presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Father God, thank you uh, that we have been baptized by the Holy Spirit. For those of us who have been born again, we just give you thanks. Um, for that new life, we give you thanks for the eternal inheritance that we have, the living hope that we have in Christ Jesus. We just ask that you would uh, help our time to be uh, productive and effective, that you would, uh, again, grant us understanding, Lord, that we would know the things that you have for us today, uh, bring it to a greater understanding in our minds and greater application in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. So we came through the first two verses, <clears throat> talked about, remember who? Uh, who do we talk about is the author of the book of Acts? Luke. Okay, Luke, good. And um, remembering that he is, in fact, not one of the 12 apostles, right? He is a Gentile. Um, he was there from early on, perhaps even in the beginning, you know, of Jesus' ministry. Uh, but he was taught primarily uh, by the apostles, by those who would have been, you know, with Jesus through that time. But we know that Luke was along for the ride, we'll find later in the, in the book of Acts, uh, that Luke was there on Paul's second and third mission journeys after, uh, after Paul is converted. And, uh, and God uses him greatly. That'll be like chapter 9. So after that, we'll see the mission journeys and see Luke uh, in there and throughout this, this letter. But he writes this uh, given the account that he gets from uh, the apostles and from those who were with Jesus in that three-year, three-and-a-half-year time of ministry Jesus had. So uh, remember, looking at that first verse, it says, the first account I composed, Theophilus, or that first letter or first book that I wrote. And so uh, remember, what is he alluding to there? What is he speaking of? What is this first account or first book that he What's wrote? What's uh, talking Luke? Yeah, the gospel. Good, the right. gospel of Luke. Uh, and so remember, we went back and looked at the Gospel of Luke and the introduction there. In the first couple of verses, it talks about this man, Theophilus, same man he has addressed this letter to. So um, Theophilus, remember that name means friend of God. And so he, Theophilus perhaps could have been someone who was funding uh, Luke's travels and trips. Like we really don't have a lot of information about him except for Luke, you know, addresses both his writings to this man. Uh, so he is instructed and told Theophilus and through Theophilus, us even, some 2,000 years later, uh, of in that first letter, remember, of Jesus' doings, as it says in verse 1, what he did and what he taught. And so uh, that's what the first letter was about. And then the second letter is going to be about now uh, picking up the baton, if you will, from that point on. The, the Gospel of Luke talks about the, the life of Jesus and the death and burial and resurrection at the very end of Luke's gospel. And then the gospel of Luke ends with the ascension of Christ into heaven. Well, here, the book of Acts picks up right there with the ascension of Christ and moves forward. So we're now moving forward into church history. And that's really this book of Acts 
is written in about 62, 63 AD. So if we think of Jesus's life ending, you know, around, say for around number 30 AD, you're talking about 30 years. So this book of Acts is the historical account of the first 30 years of the New Testament church. So it's pretty amazing. And that reminds me of something that, that, uh, that Brian talked about last week to remind us as we move forward and which you'll keep getting the reminder of it through the Holy Spirit and through, through Brian and Steve and I, that a lot of the things that we see in this book are so remarkable because that was a unique time. That first 30 years that we have the, the, the writing here of, you know, there's all these miracles and people being even raised from the dead and just amazing things that are happening at the hands of the apostles. Um, and so a lot of those things we don't see as typical or normal uh, in the church. And so uh, they're not something that are prescriptive for us. That is something that we should seek to do or that we are able to do in the sense of, I understand God is able to do anything he wants, right? So he's able to use anyone he wants to, uh, you know, lay hands and pray to somebody and that, that they would get healing. And if God chooses to, he could heal them. But we don't see them in the way we see them in this book. So we're going to see a lot of remarkable things and, uh, and that just speaks to the power of God. And, and remember that this, again, was a unique time. So God was using those things to show the power of these apostles, which, remember, speaks of someone being sent. Uh, apostolos is the, is the Greek word there, and it means a sent one. It means to be sent under the authority of someone else. Jesus was sending the apostles out under his authority, giving them and empowering them with unique things to show, remember, that they are messengers for God. And so uh, it's some amazing things that we'll see in that. And all that to say, you know, that's where he picks up here. And then in verse 2 it says, you know, in that first writing, he talked about Jesus and what he did until the day he was taken into heaven. And it says, after he had by the Holy Spirit, given orders to the apostles. So before he went up into heaven, uh, and this is a little bit of review from verse 2 last week, before he ascended into heaven, he gave them uh, commands, right? It says to those, he gave orders to those apostles. What was that command? What were those orders we looked at last week? How does the gospel end? Gospel of Luke, Gospel even Matthew 28, uh, Mark 16, all the Gospels end kind of with the same directive or commandment. What, what is that command? Jesus descending? Uh, ascending? Uh, we are ascending. Right? Yeah. Uh, yes, but before he does that, um, what does he command? The Great Commission to go out and share the Gospel. Yeah, good. Yeah, these orders, right, is the marching orders that he's given the apostles, which is, I'm about to leave. And this, again, is the passing of the baton. This is Jesus is passing the baton now to the 12 that he chose, and really 11 at this point, because remember, Judas Iscariot is dead and was not one of the 12. We will talk about later uh, who is going to fill that 12th seat. And we'll see that, in fact, in Acts 2, who, who the apostles choose to fill that seat. But then later in chapter 9, we're going to see God chose someone else to fill that seat which is going to be the Apostle Paul, okay? So Jesus is passing that baton off to these men, saying, go and teach, uh, right, go and baptize, he says, to preach the gospel and baptize people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them all the things that I've taught you. So he's saying, you guys take this thing, and you're going to continue to move it forward. That's why he says to them, when the Holy Spirit comes, you're going to do amazing things. And it's to your benefit. Remember the, the remarkable thing Jesus tells them, it's to your benefit that I leave. That's just mind-blowing to, to us, right? Well, how could it be better? <laughs> Jesus, how could it be better that you're going to leave us? And we're going to talk about that. We're going to see that, that he's saying the Spirit is going to come. It's going to be better for you. Amazing things are going to happen because this is how God chose to write the story, you guys. He's going to use the apostles in the next phase, uh, in the starting phase of, of building the church and going out and expanding the church. And then we're going to see the apostles don't live forever, right? So who are the ones the apostles pass the baton to? Next. 
Good, the church leaders who are who? Elders, Elders, pastors, right? And that's why we see them start to put in place into the church pastors and elders at all the churches. So that baton has been passed off to these men who are now called to under-shepherd, the great shepherd, in the church. And so that's kind of how God has chosen to do this. Okay, so we're talking about these as we get into verse 3. These apostles uh, that he has chosen and given the orders to, It says, he also presented himself alive after his suffering. So his suffering, speaking of the passion of the Christ, right? His uh, suffering on the cross. By many convincing proofs, appearing to them for a period of 40 days, and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom. So he came, uh, he died. Remember, they were all discombobulated. Everything was like, what is happening? What happened? He went to the cross. He died. What are we doing here? What's going to happen now? He comes back to them three days later, and he's now going to be with them for 40 days. So over that 40 days, it tells us uh, by many convincing proofs, (laughs) you know, many convincing proofs Jesus does during those 40 days. And so... um, I see some of you are still writing. That's good. I'll, I'll let you catch up there a minute. I've got it on this next slide, just a little um, slide that may be helpful. We won't uh, go through that as that'll take us a long time. Uh, but I've, I've got this slide that somebody uh, did a good job compiling and uh, that I, I think I agree with the timeline as far as the post-resurrection appearances of Christ. If you can see that, if not, uh, you can get that information certainly later um, or take a picture if you want. Uh, We're not going to go through every one of those, uh, but, you know, coming from the tomb and and just when you take the Gospels and synchronize them, you will see that these are the, I think there's 10 listed on here. We can certainly talk about Paul's, you know, later on, Uh, but these are some of the appearances that we have recorded in the Bible of Jesus presenting himself before people after the resurrection. Why would that be important? Why do you think I would pause here just to, you know, oh, hey, here's a cool slide that I want to show you, but why is it important and significant that, that Luke puts this in here and that we talk about these post-resurrection appearances of Jesus? Why is that important? Because if he didn't resurrect, then we're all here for nothing. Well said. <laughs> right? Well said. Anybody else? And also, by him... Uh doing this, he confirmed to the disciples themselves, the ones that were in doubt. So, I mean, that's okay. Also- Good. Yeah, because remember, it was a struggle for them. And then we see, you know, after his resurrection, he comes and, and we see a lot of, you know, change in them. We see in the end of, I think, Gospel of John, maybe, 20 or 21, where it says um, that he breathed on them. Uh, and they received the Holy Spirit. Like, that's when they received the Holy Spirit, you know, and that he opened their minds to the Scriptures. Like, that's when they were actually reborn or regenerated, I I believe. You know, the majority of them, they understood what the Gospel means, and they received the Holy Spirit, was after his resurrection. So a lot of confusion, like like Joe's talking about, that became clear because he he opened up their minds to understand this all. And so there's a lot of clarity coming to them because why? Now he's going to send them out. And, like, you guys got to know what you got to know. So he's going to equip them and prepare them to send them now to be his representatives. Good. He's Emmanuel now. He's really Emmanuel, like God amongst us. Yeah. These 40 days, it must have been so like, oh. Good. Yeah, think about all those encounters. I mean, it starts with Mary Magdalene going to the tomb. And, and, you know, nothing, finding the empty tomb and what's happening there. Then he comes and sees her. Then later the other, uh, kind of in the timeline, that's how I believe it goes. Then, that's why it seems contradictory. But when you, you know, consult, reconcile it all, obviously we know it's not contradictory. Because when she, he leaves, then all the other uh, ladies come and, you know, they, they all see him at the, at the place. Then uh, he talks about, in 1 Corinthians 15, you get a good account because Paul there gives a timeline. Uh, to help us. And he says that he went and saw Simon after that. Um, you know, then after that, you have the road to Emmaus in, in the Gospel of Luke, where these two two disciples are walking. They don't know who he is. And he's like, what, what do you mean? What's been happening? You don't know what's happening? What happened to Jesus? And then by the end, they're like, 
he reveals that it was him. And they're like, oh, you know, how our heart was burning within us as he taught us and told, talked to us. Uh, then he presents himself in the room while the 11 apostles are there. Uh, you know, that's a, maybe a week or so later that he shows up. Remember, Thomas was not there. And Thomas said, I won't believe. So eight days later, he comes again into the room with Thomas there saying, touch me, feel me. Uh, you know, and I love that, that part of that account where he says, you know, blessed are you because you've seen and believe. But blessed are those who have not seen and believe in me. Uh, speaking to us, right? How blessed are we because it's by faith that we've been granted to believe in Jesus. So then there's other accounts of uh, the end of Luke, uh, the end of John talks about this episode where they're, the disciples are in the, the water, uh, they're fishing, and Jesus shows up on the shore, and he's got a fire uh, going on the shore, and, and uh, he yells out to them, and they've got no fish, right? And they're in the little boat, and uh, he's like, you guys haven't caught anything, huh? And they're like, no. And he said, toss the net out on the right side. And this guy, I'm always thinking, like, how big is this boat? Like, right? Like, if they're on the left side or the front, like, it matters if they throw it on the right side, but obviously it's God saying, throw it over here, throw it now and see what happens. And they, it's so much that they can't even pull it into the boat. And so John says to Peter, hey, it's the Lord. And Peter just, you know, puts his clothes back on and jumps in the water and swims to the shore, like just being Peter, right? And so the, all of the other guys get there drying the boat. Uh, and Jesus says, you know, bring some of those fish. He's already cooking fish on the fire. He eats breakfast with them. Uh, so just a lot of things there. He goes to see James, um, his, his half-brother, and perhaps some of his other relatives. Then uh, at the end there of the, the Gospel of Luke, we have the Great Commission, where he is gathered together. Uh, there's also a gathering of over 500 people at one time uh, that is talked about in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, and then when he gathers them at the end to, to tell them, here's what you are called to do. Here's what your job is now. And then we now pick up Acts when they're going to see him now in, in the verses in the, in the next couple of weeks go into heaven and, and leave them. And, uh, and so significant because of all the things you guys have said that he's convincing them or equipping them is really a better word um, and, and equipping them to, to go out and understand greater what their purpose is. And so um, what was it that Jesus was doing at this time? All those things you guys said. And also look at the next verse appearing them for over 40 days, speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. So he was speaking of the things, still teaching them of the things of uh, the kingdom of God. That was the purpose of this visitation. This 40 days was to kind of teach them the last minute things, if you will. The final exam is coming and you're in class and it's the last week and, and the, the teacher is saying like, here's the things you definitely need to know that are going to be on the exam. You better have your notebook. You better be writing this down because these are the things I'm telling you now as your teacher, and I know the test. You need to know these things as you're going to be prepared to, to be tested. Yeah, Scott. Did you say that Luke was not an apostle? Correct. Yeah, he's not one of the 12 apostles. He is a disciple. Um, and sorry, I, we talked about that a little bit last week. Yes, sir. Um, and, you know, neither was John Mark, who wrote the Gospel of Mark. Uh, so when we think about, oh, the disciples, we kind of go Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and go through the books of the Bible. But the 12 are the ones who are listed in, I think, John chapter 6, Matthew chapter 10. Um, you can look and see the 12 listed there. Um, you know, and, and those are the 12 that he chose, which would be, uh, you guys probably help me here, Simon Peter and James, his brother. Uh, uh, sorry, Peter and um, uh, whom? Andrew, sorry, the brothers. Simon, Peter, and Andrew, brothers. James and John, uh, brothers. There's another James, son of Alphaeus. There's another Simon, the zealot. There's uh, Philip, Matthew, Thomas, Bartholomew, Thaddeus, uh, and Judas Iscariot. So no Luke. No Mark. Some of, some of the names we think of, like those weren't in the 12. They were, remember, he has hundreds of disciples, but they weren't the 12 of the 12 apostles. He wasn't one of those. Hey, Mark, Mark, Judas Mark again? Jewish? What's that? Who replaced Judas again? I forget. Uh, Matthias. We're going to get in that in Acts chapter 2. Yeah, was Matthias it? was the one chosen to take his place, but really we'll see. I think God chooses Paul 
to replace him because we don't. Uh, um, they casted lots and chose Matthias, but he's going to be replaced. <laughs> and Luke was the only Gentile or Mark also of not being apostles. I mean, he had know, lots of Gentile disciples. Huh? And lots of Gentile disciples. There's right, going to be. Right, but I'm saying the, the, the names are in the Bible. You got Mark and you got Luke. The books. Okay. Luke was Gentile, correct? Yeah. And then was Mark also a Gentile or was Mark Jewish? Just curious. No, I think John no, Mark. Luke was the only Gentile. John Mark was a, a Jew. Of the, of the Bible. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I misunderstood for a minute. I gotcha. And then also, as we were talking about it, can you compare the, the 40 days of Christ being on earth? Does it have any resemblance to the 40 days of the, of, uh, you know, the 40 years also for, uh, you know, the, the number 40, is, you know, with the yeah. temptation, right, 40 days? Is there anything? Is, I mean, just curious. The number 40. No, it's a good question. I mean, when you do kind of studies of numbers, you know, you could talk about three or seven or 40. There's definitely uh, there's repetition, which is, you know, funny, not funny, uh, haha, but just funny because that's been in my brain. And uh, I'll talk about that a little bit in the sermon uh, next hour, just that repetition of, of things that we see. Yeah, there was 40 years in the wilderness, 40 days in the wilderness for Jesus. And that means probation, um, right? That's what he said, right? You know, so 40, um, you know, 40 days here. Uh, but to, to say, you know, uh, to speak intelligently, I guess, into the mind of God to say why that is, I don't think any of us could do. <laughs> you know, um, but perhaps, you know, some symbolism there. Um, I'll ask Brian next time. <laughs> <laughs> hey, he's sitting right there. <laughs> Always welcome to chime in. Uh, yeah, there, there perhaps could be some symbolism there, but, uh, you know, I don't have any that I'm going to okay. draw any parallels to or anything right, right as of now. Um, yeah, good things to study and, and look into, though. So, yeah, he's equipping, he's encouraging, he's preparing them, uh, you know, and, and that's going to be the rest of this letter, the rest of this book is going to be now about what we're talking about, the next passing of the baton we're going to see happen in the book of Acts over this 30 years that we're going to talk about. Um, they are now, for the rest of the book, going to be preparing others in the same way to carry on the, the torch as Jesus is doing them. And so over this 30 year span, that's going to be, you know, what they're tasked with is they're going to be doing the same thing with other believers. Okay. So, um, next he says, he gathers them together, um, in verse four, gathering them together. Um, some of your versions might say, uh, lodging with them. The word there for lodging and gathering also can be translated as eating. Um, so eating with them, lodging with them, while gathering with them, all kind of referring to the same thing, that he is amongst them, that he is with them, that he is calling them to himself. And now he gives them another commandment here. As he commands them to go and, and speak and proclaim the gospel, he now commands them first something else, right? And what is it? What, is, what does he tell them here to do <laughs> or not to do? Not depart from here. Yeah, do not depart from here. So he says, uh, you know, don't, don't leave this place right here where we're gathering. So which one is it? Like, how are they supposed to leave and go into all the world and tell the gospel and preach the gospel if he tells them they're not supposed to leave? Being in the, um, not I leave from my presence, like, I have been me as a Lord and Savior. That's what I... Uh, okay. Yeah, and to abide. But it's okay for them to go and witness the verse by the Bible. Yeah, it's just, uh, okay. Yeah, and, and certainly uh, we see in First John, I think of as the men are there, the word abide, you know, just being a, a big emphasis there, but certainly abiding in him, you know, and that he will abide in us, more importantly, right? That he will not leave us uh, is, is a huge important thing there. Uh, what else? What might be another part of this? The main thing, the, the Pentecost. Okay, what about it? They don't go from here because after he leaves to wait up in the upper room and that's where the God is going to do his main okay it's going to be like the guess, yeah good what was that then 5,000 change that day whenever he, yeah. they go out and start speaking tongues and the Holy Spirit yeah. correct which is going to come a little bit later after what you just said uh, which at is the end of the 40 days though it's the, or no, 
yeah, it's going to be after. So, um, and that's where we're kind of at in our in our text is that 40 days, he's going to now ascend. And right before he ascends, he's telling them, do not leave. And in the context, you know, you guys are, are spot on because he says, uh, wait for the, the what the Father had promised, which you had heard from me. And so um, these are the things that you're talking about. What What is it that they're waiting for? They're waiting for this promise that they had been told by Jesus would happen. Oh, yeah. You which is what? You two are both alluding to. The yes. Holy Spirit yeah. will come upon you. Okay, so let's look back at John 14. Let's let's go look at uh, what is it that, that God has promised that Jesus had told them about. Uh, also the lady at the well. John 14. Right. What's that? Wasn't that also the... When he met the Samaritan woman at the well, that he said, oh, one day you'll be able to, to worship, I mean... Oh, like to worship in spirit and truth, yeah. right? And it wouldn't matter where you worship. Yeah, correct. That They won't worship there. They'll be able to worship everywhere. Uh, John chapter 14. <clears throat> And this is a, a good little section here, but if somebody wants to read it for us, I think it's going to be helpful and beneficial. If somebody wants to read from verse 16 to uh, 26. Anybody game to do that? Dean? Yeah, oh, thank you, brother. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is, the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see him or know him. But you know him, because he abides with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. After a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live, you will live also. Okay, pause. So the world will no longer see me, obviously referring to his ascension, that he's about to depart and leave. But yet, I will still be with you. Uh, and speaking there in the verse, end of verse 17, the Holy Spirit will be in you. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. Judas said to him, Lord, what then has happened that you are going to disclose yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while abiding with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. Okay. God bless you. So there's the, you know, there's the word. There's the promise. There's an account of what Jesus had told them as he's saying here in Acts before he leaves, he's like, wait here because the Father's going to send you the promise that I told you about, okay? And remember the things that I've told you. And, and that's, one of the, uh, that's one of the jobs. That's one of the things the Holy Spirit does. He tells us right there in, in that text that the Holy Spirit will bring to, to your mind and remind you the things that I've told you so that you will remember those things. And so... Uh, that's important because, you know, you think about this at the, the very beginning stage and where they are uh, about to be the beginning stage of Jesus' leaving. I mean, uh, he's looking at these guys. You know, I'm just thinking of the room myself and looking at seeing Peter and going, look, we're just getting ready to kick this thing off. Don't go out there and blow this thing, Peter. <laughs> like, don't go, don't go under your own power and go blow this right off the get-go. Like, wait until I send the help that you need uh, to go do this thing the way we need to do it. Um, right? And I think, I think it's, that's kind of our human perspective that I have is that's what we're talking about. Because in Peter's power and in my own power, I can do nothing. Uh, and, and so he's telling them, uh, you know, the team is ready. Uh, I've prepared you. You're about to go out on the field and play, but do not go out there until I put the quarterback in the huddle because you guys 
don't know how to run the play. You don't know how to execute it without the quarterback, who's be a direct link with the coach, right? And whatever, it's not a perfect analogy. It's just one that comes to mind uh, to say the quarterback needs to be out there to, to guide every single person on that field, to put them where they need to be, and he will be the one that will throw you the ball so that you can move the ball down the field and we can do this thing, right? Does that make sense? So don't go yet. He's saying, be ready, be ready to go, be ready to go, but wait, not yet. Don't don't leave yet. Uh, and so... That's a good uh, way. You could also add to it that Peter gets the ball in the first play. Oh, here we and, go. And goes 40 yards. Uh, here we go. Oh, 40 <laughs> yards. It's a 40-yard pass. Excellent. Excellent. Good. <laughs> what, what? They score with the extra kick. <laughs> It's a 40-yard field goal. Um, okay, we can go with this one. We've got 10 minutes. We've got one coming up that I know we will not have time to get into. We'll do that next week. But maybe let's talk a little bit about the 40 days. I do want to talk some about this because he now says in verse 5, uh, John baptized you with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Uh, Matthew chapter 3, we see the baptism of, of Jesus there. And he speaks, John the Baptist there speaks of that I'm baptizing with water, but the one coming behind me, right, will baptize uh, with the Holy Spirit. And so uh, we know the scriptures speak of this baptism of the Holy Spirit. We're not going to side rail into that this morning. That's going to be next week. We'll talk about different baptisms that are being spoke of here and that, uh, you know, that we see in the scriptures and talk about scripturally what they mean versus, you know, not what the some churches may say they mean. So we'll look at that next week. So uh, don't even think about jumping in a rabbit trail or trying to get me going there. We're not, I'm not following you this morning. So we can do it next week, you said? Next week. <laughs> Lord, if the Lord wills, if the Lord wills. It is in the notes. So if the Lord wills next week, we'll be there. Um, you know, so he tells them to wait for this. And he says, it will happen not many days from now. Well, some of you who know who my brain works, uh, the question then is how many days from now are we talking about? Ten days. Um, ten days? Okay, good guess. Let's, let, us, let us do some math together. So how many days from now? Uh, when does this um, baptism of the Holy Spirit take place? You guys talked about it already. We'll see it in chapter 2. It's going to happen on the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost was one of the feast of festivals that the Jewish people would recognize. All the people would be flooding in from all the surrounding areas to come to Jerusalem, just as they did during the Passover when Jesus was crucified. So um, Pentecost, the word Pentecost actually means 50, okay? Or it means the 50th day. So Pentecost, this feast, is held 50 days after the Passover, okay? So you have the Passover, which is one of the celebrations of the feast. Remember, that is when Jesus, right now, uh, at this time, Jesus was crucified and died on Passover. 50 days after Passover would be Pentecost. Are you following me? And that's how they kept it forever. That's how it was here. So this is in between that time that Jesus is visiting with them. He's been killed, resurrected, and those things have happened, right? Everybody's with me? So let's break down these 50 days, because we know the scriptures give us 50 days, Passover to Pentecost. The Holy Spirit comes on the day of Pentecost. Jesus killed on the Passover. So we have the, the timeline, 50 days. He died on Passover, raised three days later, right? There's three days. How many days do you spend here on the earth with the disciples? 40. That gives us how many days left? 13. That, that's 43 days so far. I know, public school math. Let me just put it on the board. Let me put it on the board so we don't get all confused. But I think 40 plus 3 is 43. 50 minus 43. Craig and Caitlin, you guys went to public, uh, private school. Come on, tell us. What is 50 minus 43? 7. So we've got 7 days defined here as the it will happen not many days from now. So we've got one week that they're going to be in that upper room that we're going to look at later. So we know that's the time frame in our mind that we're talking about. Does that make sense? Yep. And as you see, next slide, different baptisms. Oh, not today. Sorry. Yeah, we're not doing that now, Jose. We're not going to get that accomplished in five minutes. 
and uh, there's going to be much questions and dialogue to that now, I know. Uh, but are there questions and dialogue pertaining to what we're talking about here this morning? And maybe we can wrap a big bow of application on it for us before we, before we finish. And so um, everybody understands that, the 50 days. We understand why it is he's telling them to wait for the Holy Spirit. So maybe some application in the realm of, of that. Well, one thing I see, if you don't mind. Oh, sure. That we're talking about, uh, he says here, you know, uh, to the apostles whom he had chosen. So, yes, in that time, there's a bunch of disciples, and there's a bunch of, you know, there are people taking out demons in his name that even his apostles did not even know about. Remember that, that he says, hey, who are those guys? He says, hey, don't worry, they're good. Yep. But here, it, you know, the beginning of the church is so important because he handpicked 11, it was 12, but one, he handpicked, you know, God handpicked and gave to him. So it was like to be as, you know, we're watching the history of the beginning of the church, period. You know, there's yep. no, oh, yeah, they did this. Okay, this is like the fundamentals of the beginning of the. Everybody good with slides? I'm going to shut it down. Um, yeah, exactly. That is what we're seeing in this historical account. Yeah, Scott? And from that point on, too, like when it was handed from the apostles to the church leaders and pastors and, and so on and so forth, that's when I feel like that's when like the, the branches of the tree started growing out and, and that's when little changes started happening in, in what was Sure. Yeah. The gro the like the growing pains, right? Yeah. Right. And these letters, like you said, are speaking to the growing pains the church was going through with Jesus being gone. <laughs> yeah. yeah. As you said that, um, you know, I want to draw maybe some application from what you guys are saying um, that. The pastors, the church leaders, but all of us, you know, as followers in Christ, going back to the apostles and their need uh, for the Holy Spirit. I mean, that is that is our reliance. That is what we need. We cannot do these things in our own power. We wrapped up. Remember Ephesians, our study in Ephesians, and that putting on the whole armor of God. Remember, it starts in verse ten. There, saying, "Be strong in the power of His might." Uh, that the Holy Spirit is the one who strengthens us and empowers us to be able to preach, to be able to teach, to be able to speak to people, to be able to minister to people, to be able to do the things that we do in his name and for his glory. And so we've got to understand and recognize our, you know, desperate need of reliance upon the Holy Spirit. You know, uh, we need that. I need that this morning as, as I'm teaching. I need you guys to have that this morning in our conversation. Uh, I need that next hour in the preaching. You need that, you know, as you go about your day with your family later, um, you know, as you go to visit um, a friend or someone in need later. Like, it, it just is, you know, the fuel for us. Uh, you know, it's, it's not anything that we have within us, but it's because of, like Kennard alluded to, that he is with us and that we are to abide in him because he abides in us. And so... We've got to show that um, by doing the things he's commanded us to do as we look at the apostles here and he's telling them again, do, do the things that I told you to do, but wait, because I'm telling you to do this first, then go do those things. Like, here's an order, but these are all commandments. And back to John saying, uh, Jesus in the Gospel of John saying, uh, those who keep my commandments are those who love me and those whom I love and those whom the Father has loved and given to me. And so if you're one of those then you are ultimately dependent upon everything in your life on the Holy Spirit and the power of God. And you'll, you'll consult with the Holy Spirit, you'll consult, you'll pray on it, you'll, you know, first things first, you know. Good. That's like, you know, when you go and try to spread, to spread the gospel to someone else, you know, ask for his help first. Yeah. Then go forward. You know? Good. Like, it's just like bringing it back to the Bible, you know, like, this is, this is the closest thing to the roots of the tree that we got. Yeah. Other than our prayer, obviously. Yeah. Second to our prayer. Yeah, I mean, this is it. You're right. This is the word. That's what we've got. 
they had it differently, uh, and we have it differently now, but we have the same spirit. The same spirit that equipped them to be sent out is the same spirit he gives to you that equips you to also be sent out. I feel it's somewhat like Peter that you were describing, <laughs> like, uh, and trying to get ahead of that often. And so it's a good reminder always to me, and when we're doing studying this, to remember God's timing in all things from the beginning to now, and that he always has a plan. They're always, like, and they didn't understand any of that, and I know that I don't understand any of it now. You know what I mean? And just to always remember, he has a plan, it's his timing. Yeah. Something's coming, but to be patient and wait on him, wait on the, the prompting of the Holy Spirit, because that's what he's provided for me to go on and yeah. his word. And Good. I can see myself as Peter. <laughs> I think we all can. Back then, it so was all word of mouth. We got wrapped up. That. Now we got, I could text you something, fax you something, whatever. You know, back then it was word of mouth. So, hey, I heard this, that, and then I could see that the struggles they had, not struggles, but as far as for you to go into a town and say, oh yeah, we heard about Christ, like, it just happened, where, where you, you know, it was like, it was hard, it was, it was simple, it was pure, it was just, you know, and it was an act of a disciple and an act of an apostle, everybody had their little apostleship, I'm sending you, the apostle told the disciple, and the disciple told another, you know, converted the disciple, so it's a big, you know, pyramid spider, scheme, yeah, yeah. only not a scheme, yeah, yeah. yeah. good, Thank you so much. We've uh, we've got to close, so let's uh, let's do that. And uh, uh, maybe uh, Sky, would you close for us? Thank you.